And we ask these things this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, dear brothers. So the topic uh, that we're going to look at this morning um, is out of Luke 13, verse 22 to 30. Luke 13, verse 22 to 30. And the topic uh, that we're looking at this morning is, um, are so few being saved? And we'll get back to that about halfway through this study. We'll get back to that question, are so few being saved? Um, but let's turn to Luke 13, verse 22 to 30. And I'm going to go ahead and read that passage, and then we'll go ahead and, um, we'll go ahead and unpack it and take it apart a little bit. Luke 13, uh, verse 22. And Jesus was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, are just a few, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door, saying, Lord, open up to us. Then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some are first who will be last. (laughs) So it's interesting just to look uh, right off the top here. Um, at verse 23 and someone said to him lord are there just a few who are being saved and he said to them strive to enter through the narrow door for many i tell you will seek to enter and will not be able and this reminds me a little bit of john chapter 3 when nicodemus came to jesus by night And he said that we know that you're a prophet from God for nobody could do these signs that you're doing unless God is with him. And so Jesus doesn't even address the statement there in John chapter three. And it's really the same thing here. Someone says, are there just a few who are being saved? And so instead of answering his question, Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door. Um, So, So that's the question. Are there just a few who are being saved? Let's turn to John chapter six, John chapter six. And we'll look at verse 35 to dig in a little bit to that question. Are there just a few who are being saved? John six, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said that to you, that you have seen me, yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore, the Jews were grumbling about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, 
He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Verse 63. This is really the key verse out of this passage. Um, because a lot has been made of what Jesus said here. Um, Unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. And he says it over and over. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Look at verse 63. Jesus said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. So Jesus tells us here in verse 63 that what he is talking about eating his flesh, drinking his blood. He's the bread of life. Those are spiritual words, not physical, literal words. So that's really important to to correctly interpret this passage. Verse 64, Jesus said, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who it was who would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me Less it has been granted him from the Father. So we see right also from this passage that salvation is wholly a work from God. J- Jesus said back in verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Verse 66. So here's another, here's another key verse in this passage. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. Very, very sad statement. So Jesus said to the 12, you do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I myself not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. So prior to this passage in John 6, Jesus had fed the 5,000, and it was probably a lot more than that. It said that it was 5,000 men. Um, That's not including the women and children that were there. So you have this massive crowd of people that are following Jesus. They're following him. Um, So he ends up in the synagogue in Capernaum, He's telling them these spiritual things that they can't wrap their head around. It causes them to stumble and literally everybody leaves except for the 12. And really, if you want to be technical, you could say everybody left except for the 11 because um, Judas wasn't obviously a true disciple. So the, so back to the original question, are so few being saved? I think a great illustration of that we see here in John chapter six. Yes. So few are being saved. Um, Let's look at Matthew 7, verse 13. Matthew 7, verse 13. And again, we're we're looking at, at the question, are so few being saved? Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. 
and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Let's look at Luke 16, 16. Luke 16, 16. Before we do that, let's go back to the original text of Luke 13, and let's look at verse 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And so now from that verse 24, we're going to look at um, a few uh, supporting scriptures. So if you turn over to Luke 16, 16, Luke 16, 16 reads, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the gospel of the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. Everyone is forcing his way into it. So that's really just another way of saying strive to enter through the narrow door. <clears throat> Let's look at Luke 19, 1 through 10. Luke 19, 1 through 10. So this is the, the familiar story um, of Zacchaeus, Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus says, strive to enter. So we're going to read that. That's exactly what Zacchaeus does. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. So I'll stop right there for just one second. If Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector or just a tax collector at all, um, he would have been looked down upon by those in the Jewish society. Uh, he wouldn't have been allowed to be in the synagogue. He would have been looked at as a sinner. Um, he would have been looked at as a traitor, as an outcast, uh, because uh, essentially he was working for the Romans. And what the tax collectors used to do um, at that time is they had a certain amount that they needed to collect uh, for the Romans. And then anything that they collected above that, that would be their profit. And so you could imagine the kind of abuses that would have taken place um, with, uh, with tax collectors at that time. It wasn't going to be done fairly. They, they even had thugs and goons that worked for them that they could send to shake people down for money. So, um, so tax collectors were guilty of, of grave uh, injustices with the people. Um, verse three, Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we see a great illustration here of Zacchaeus striving to enter through, through the narrow door, striving to enter. He physically runs ahead and goes and gets up into a tree so he can see Jesus. And then Jesus tells him to come down. He comes down. The, the, the religious leaders complain because Jesus is going to be the guest of someone who's a sinner. And then somewhere, somewhere in there, we don't, we don't read it, but somewhere in there in Luke 19, uh, 1 through 11, um, something happens to Zacchaeus. So some, some uh, wonderful work of the Holy Spirit happens to Zacchaeus. We see that his heart was changed in that, that amount of time. Let's look at Matthew 
11, 12. Matthew 11, 12. Matthew eleven twelve. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. If you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. <laughs> so th this is an interesting statement. The kingdom of, of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. And really what what that that's just another way of saying to, to strive to enter through the narrow door, to agonize. So our salvation isn't something that's casual. It's not an add-on. It's something that's it's something that's drastic. It's something that should really change every aspect of our lives. And so when you think of the kingdom of heaven suffering violence and violent men taking it by force, they grab it and hold on to it and, and grip it. It's not something casual where you just kind of wander in in a country club um, kind of an atmosphere. It's uh, deep soul work ha has taken place in someone who, who is striving to enter through the narrow gate. Deep conviction, deep repentance. Let's look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13, starting in verse 44. So here we have Jesus telling many of his wonderful parables. Matthew 13, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking, seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all he had and bought it. So a question for you, brothers and sisters. Did you find the treasure hidden in the field? And from joy over that treasure, did, have you sold everything you had and bought that field? And if you found that one pearl of great value, have you sold all you've had and bought it? So again, that's a very simple picture of salvation. Not something, not something partial, not something halfway, not something casual, but, but selling all you have to, to buy it, giving up everything you have to buy it, everything that you have in the flesh um, that you were hanging on to, to before. Um, let's look at... Let's go back to Luke 11 and we'll look, I'm sorry, Luke 13, and we'll look at verse 25. Luke 13, verse 25. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you yourselves will be thrown out. And they will come from east and west and from north and south and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. And so we're going to look at some supporting scriptures of that, that section of this main text this morning. Um, so let's look at Matthew 24. Matthew 24, starting in verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. So our Lord Jesus says, 
Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. I want to stop there just for one quick second at verse 44. Um, forever now, people um, have tried to make predictions on when the Lord is going to return. It's going to be at this time. It's going to be at that time. We have these signs over here. We have these signs over there. Um, it says right here, for this reason, you must also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. That applies to everybody. So if somebody is trying to predict a certain time or a date um, of when the Lord is going to come back, um, that person is in biblical error. So let's just keep that in mind. Who then is faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come at a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. In verse 45, the faithful and sensible slave whom the master put in charge of his household to give them the food at the proper time, that's the faithful believer. That's the faithful believer who is feeding the sheep. The Lord says that he's going to be blessed and he's going to get in, uh, put in charge of all his possessions. That can be looked at as an, as an inheritance uh, of eternal life. So then, then the contrast is the evil slave. It says in his heart, my master is not coming for a long time. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. So this is someone who's an unbeliever. This says, well, the Lord's not coming back for a really long time. So I've got time. You know, um, I'm under grace. I'm under super grace. So I can live and act any way I want. That's, that's not the way someone, someone lives who has salvation. And then in verse 50, again, we see. The master of that slave will come at a day when he does not expect him and at an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's look at Matthew 7, 21 to 27. Matthew 7. 21 to 27. Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So our Lord Jesus um, here in verse uh, 21 to 23 is, um, is explaining to us the tragedy of someone who thinks they are believing someone who thinks they're in the kingdom but someone who's not in the kingdom because they don't have a life um they don't have a life that's lived in obedience to the word of god he tells us clearly 
in verse 23, I never knew you, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So this is clearly um, a group of uh, people who think they're in, but they're not in because there's been there's been no internal change. There's been no deep um, work of the Holy Spirit to change to change the heart. Verses 24 to 27, um, Jesus gives us a parable of two builders. And he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, well, what are these words of mine? You, you could you could interpret that as the Bible, not not just what he's saying in this section here, but his word, God's word, right? Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when, he's ta- when he talks about the rain falling and the floods coming and the winds blowing and slamming against that house, this here is the day of judgment. So somebody, somebody who has salvation, somebody who has the Holy Spirit living inside them um, on that day when they have to face the Lord and give an account of what they've done for their life, um, someone who has salvation, who has the Holy Spirit living in them will be able to stand. That person that person's house will be able to stand. Um, to contrast that, um, in verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, well, if someone's not acting on the words of God, um, it means that they, they've heard it and they've rejected it. That's that's what verse 26 means. That person will be a foolish man who built his house on the sand. That's the unbeliever. That person will not be able to stand uh, one day when they have to stand before God and to face him. Let's look, let's look at Luke uh, 6, verse 46. Luke 6, verse 46. Luke 6. Verse 46. So our Lord Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of the house was great. So this is obviously a parallel of um, Matthew 7, um, 24, right? It's really really just a a parallel of that uh, Matthew passage. Verse 48, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation. Well, what, is it, what does it mean to d- dig deep? We were talking about agonizing to enter through the narrow gate. That means that if someone dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock, um, the Holy Spirit's come in. The Holy Spirit has changed that heart. They have a foundation uh, based on, on Jesus Christ and his word and on nothing else. So I'm gonna I'm I'm just gonna go back to the original question: um, Are so few being saved? And then I'm I'm kind of gonna kind of shift um, the narrative a little bit here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that are so few are so few are so few sorry being saved? That's the wrong question. That's not the question we should be asking. Um, and if you and if you think about the passage in Luke 13 that we started with. Somebody asked Jesus that question, and he didn't answer. He didn't answer. He went, he, he went right into something else. He said, strive to enter through the narrow door. So are so few being saved isn't the question we should be asking. Here's the question we should be asking is, um, am I being saved? Not others, but am I being saved? Are you being saved, Right. How do you know that you're being saved? Well, let's look at let's look at John chapter three. You know that you're being saved because you've been born again. That's how you know you're being saved. 
So John chapter 3, uh, starting in verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So, so again, I, um, I think that this passage is similar to the one that we started with in Luke 13, um, where somebody makes one statement to Jesus and Jesus doesn't address that statement or, or the question. This is just a statement, but the, the one in Luke was a question. He doesn't address it. Instead, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So no, 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 uh, no comment on what Nicodemus said at all. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So in other words, that person needs to be cleansed by the word of God. And they need to have their heart changed by the Holy Spirit. They need to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Verse six, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So Jesus makes a distinction between the flesh and the spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So if you've been born again, then that means you've repented. Okay. So we'll just go through a couple of points here, a couple of uh, evidences. We'll have, we'll have five of them. So let's look back at Luke 13. Luke 13, one through nine. Jesus teaches on repentance, Luke 13, one through nine. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him, to Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In verse four, or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower, tower of Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling this parable. A man had a fig tree that had been planted in his vineyard. And he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, behold, for three years, I have come looking for fruit on this tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, let it alone, sir, for this year too, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. So this could be taken a couple different ways. This parable, um, this could be looked at as the three years um, that Jesus had his ministry um, in Israel. He didn't find any fruit. And so it's well documented in the Gospels that, um, that uh, for the most part, the nation of Israel was, um, was going to be taken out of the kingdom because of their unbelief. Um, but what about, what about us, right? Is, is there any fruit? Is there any evidence of, um, of salvation? And if, if there, if there is none and there's never any, then, um, then we're going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. Very clear in, in scripture. And so the, vin the vineyard keeper, um, or the, the, the man that's that's tending the, the vineyard um, is asking the vineyard keeper to to wait just a little bit longer. He says, I'm going to dig around it and put in fertilizer. You could look at that as that I'm going to continue preaching. I'm going to continue sharing the word. Um, 
And then if it bears fruit next year, fine. So if there was a change, if there's salvation next year, fine. Then you don't have to cut, cut it down. But if not, cut it down. So that would be judgment. That would be judgment. So the, the, the lesson here is repent, repent. In Matthew 4, 17, um, it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I, I never get tired of that scripture. Um, we, we, we need to go back to it again and again. It says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that means he continuously preached repentance. And if you've been born again, you've repented. That was the first point that we looked at. Um, the second one is that you're a new creation. You're a new creation. So 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And this, uh, this isn't something that's, that's theoretical or just something that's um, intellectual. Um, literally, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has been born again, um, he's going to be a new man. She's going to be a new woman. Um, the old things have passed away. What would that look like? If, if I was living in, in adultery, if I was uh, drunk, um, if I was chasing after uh, pornography, other, other things, if I was chasing after money, um, the power of the Holy Spirit um, is going to change that in a person. I'm not going to be the same old man. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a new man. Um, you're going to be a new person if the Holy Spirit has come into you. So if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he's going to be a new, a new creature, a new creation. So, the third point I'm, I'm looking at um, on, under how do we know if we're saved is you believe God's word, you love it, and you obey it. So let's, let's look at Luke 8, Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, verse 19 to 21. And Jesus' mother and brothers came to him, and they were unable to get to him because of the crowd. And it was reported to him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wishing to see you. But Jesus answered and said to them, my mother and my brothers are th these who hear the word of God and do it. My mother and my brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. I think James says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. Let's look at Luke 11, Luke 11, verses 27 to 28. Jesus, again, is, is preaching to the crowd. Verse 27 says, while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast at which you nursed. But Jesus said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So this, this woman in the crowd is alluding to something that's, that's strictly um, of the flesh, right? The womb, of, the womb of Mary and then the fact that Jesus would have to nurse as a baby. But Jesus said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. So he, he dismisses the flesh and he goes straight to the spirit. So if you've been born again, you're going to bear fruit in some measure. You're going to bear fruit in some measure. So let's look at Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22. You're going to bear fruit, fruit in some measure if you've been born again. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Let's look at Matthew 13, 
thirteen twenty three. Matthew thirteen twenty three. So we're we're back to this section again where um, Jesus is given these wonderful parables to tell us about the kingdom of heaven, what it looks like. These these wonderful uh, word pictures. Matthew thirteen twenty three. So Jesus had just given us the parable of the soils. He had explained the parable of the soils. There was um, one good type of soil. There were three types of soil that weren't good, that the word of God couldn't, uh, didn't penetrate. So in, in verse 23, Jesus says, and the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. And I actually read this, and this is where I got the heading that you're going to bear fruit in some measure, right? So some are going to, some are going to bear a lot of fruit. Some are going to bear a medium amount of fruit. Some are going to bear a little bit of fruit. But if you, but if you have the spirit of God living in you, you're going to bear some fruit. That's what the scripture tells us. So the last point that, that I have this morning here is that if you're being saved or if you're born again, you're going to persevere through trials. Let's look at Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. So really the key here is verse three. Um, this is perseverance through trials and tribulations. And again, Paul writes, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character hope. And so, None of these examples should be taken by themselves, right? Um, we know that we're being saved if we've been born again, if the Holy Spirit um, is living in us. Um, and this, this, this list of five points that I came up with isn't exhaustive. I'm sure there could be more. These are just five that I had. And again, I said that you've repented. You're a new creation. You believe God's word and you love it and you obey it. You bear fruit in some measure and you persevere through trials. So, okay, that's all I have for this morning. So, um, brother, if you want to go ahead and uh, open it up. Yeah, great message, Brother Lauren, as usual. Um, I like that one in Luke 13, verse 30. And the NOT version says, um, and note this. Some who seem least important now will be the greatest then. And some who are the greatest now will be least important then. You know, we put so much weight in the people's statuses, you know, even in the church. You know, someone comes, a celebrity comes in the church, everybody, oh, everybody's eyes is on the celebrity instead of eyes on Jesus. You know, it's, everybody's so important about their, what they do in life, their job status. We even started in high school. You know, you notice, I, I noticed just looking on Facebook, you know, some of those guys that were, you know, superstar athletes or whatever, they never went beyond high school. But in in high school, they were walking on water. And one guy I know is homeless now. And so it's like, you know, uh, but all this importance was put in what he did. You know, somebody can catch a football. They're the greatest thing walking around here. And um, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's not important to the kingdom of God. You know, um, you got people that are rich, that are just, you know, in church, you know, the, the rich people rule what happens, you know, 
You don't want to, they, they get to make the big decisions because they have they big donors and things like that. And so I says, well, you might seem important now, <laughs> but you know, it's not going to happen. So uh, yeah, I, I like that. Uh, that's why we, you know, we, like I said, we, we, you know, we think we're so important and we exalt ourselves and, um, and we should be, you know, someone has a, God gave you a gift of, of singing, you know, why should you be more important? Because you got a gift, you know, so we use that for the glory of the kingdom. So um, that's why the door is so narrow. Because people take things and, and don't use it to glorify God in what you're doing. And, and we, that's just like actually worshiping idols. You know, we put people on pedestals, you know, celebrities, it's because you can tell jokes that you should be, you know, put up on a, on a pedestal like that. And, um, you know, everything else is out, out the window, no matter what your character is, you know, you know, we, especially in football or any kind of sport, you would put people in there to have bad character because they can catch football. And then when they do something out of pocket, Oh, wow. Look at that. You know, I mean, like Antonio Brown, <laughs> You know the guy was bonkers when you put him in there, but now it's now he's like he's the talk of the town because he does something that was weird. Well, it's okay when he's catching touchdowns, but you know now he's doing all these things. So anyway, um, but yeah, we put our importance on what you do, not you know what what kind of job you do instead of what your uh, what's on the inside, what you do for God. Yeah. Good message. Yes, thank you so much. That I, I, I like the explanation about Luke chapter 19. He is uh, about Zacchaeus, how he has said, and that passage is touching my heart. <clears throat> Can we see? I just want to give one scripture passage on Matthew chapter 25, verse 34. We see. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye, blesses my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from foundation of the world. God's kingdom prepared for us the foundation of the world. The way he approached with Jacob, Zacchaeus also we see. Uh, how he prepared for us the kingdom. And then the way you explain about the spiritual food and how we receive uh, our <laughs> salvation. This whole thing. Thank you. Amen, brother. Brother Lauren, thanks for the for the good uh, word. I love it. You know, you you said a couple of things, and I, and I just love it how you said. Um, the real question is, are we being saved? You know, we're always looking at everybody else. Yeah, we got to take the plank out of our own eye before we can take the speck out of somebody else's eye. You know, we got to worry about ourselves first, and know that we're gonna that we're saved. So I think that's one of the true questions there. But uh, <clears throat> in uh, Matthew seven, where it says, uh, "Not everyone who's who, uh, what's how's that go? Not everyone that uh, let me go to it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but who does the will of the Father in heaven." So, you know, so what is the, that? Uh, and then we got to look at that. And it's basically um, the good works is, you know, people said, well, what is the good works? They asked them that question in, in 20, you know, that, what is that? And to believe in the, in the one he sent. Um, <clears throat> we must believe in the one that he sent, you know. So if we believe in that and do, and the good works that, that we believe in that he sent. God wants us to have the faith in his son. This is a commandment that believes in the name of the son. So that's one of the things that we should we need to do. And these these works is this is that his commandment that we believe in the name of, of the son of Jesus and love one another just as he has commanded us. And that is first john three twenty three so it he's he's given us these commandments what we need to do to be saved and 
and that he'll know us. And the second thing is just another thing that you said when he says, I did not know you depart from me. <clears throat> I mean, people, you know, you think about that because is he ever knowing God? Yes, he is. But it's not that we, that he knows us. It's just that we know him. I think that's the, the question that needs to be, do you really know your Lord? You know, because he knows us. He knows our heart. And that's what you, you brought up too. It's, it's all about the heart too. So there's a lot of good points that you brought there that I can just keep going on. We can, like you said, it's one of those things that we can just study on forever and ever uh, on this. And um, I had some other things in there too, but I'm just going to leave it at that. But yeah, it's, it's that we know him and believe in the son, the one that he sent and do the good works. I mean, that's, that's really one of the most important things um, that we got to do. I mean, like I said, there's so many more comments that I can put out there on that too. But yeah, you were you were right on on this. So I thank you for your uh, study. Praise God for His Word. A couple of yeah. quick comments on what you you were talking about. Um, you mentioned um, Matthew seven twenty three, um, and that I will declare to them, I never knew you. Uh, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. When when Jesus says that he never knew someone, it doesn't mean that he wasn't aware of them. It means he, he never knew them, um, in an intimate way. Yes. Right? Um, yeah. the Bible, the Bible doesn't, I don't know if the Bible ever uses the word relationship, but yet we, we do have a relationship to God. Um, however, um, that's, that's the difference, right? Um, I never knew yep. you means I never knew you in an intimate way. I never knew you as my own. You're not mine. You don't belong to me. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that I think is, is important to know. Of course he, he's aware God's aware of everything. You know, you can't, you can't teach God anything. Um, and then you were talking about what, um, about the works, right? What, what are the yep. works that we do? Just look at Matthew seven twenty four. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, um, may be compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. So we hear the word of God and we act on it. That's Ephesians 2, 8. So really quickly, and I'll, and I'll stop talking after this. Ephesians mm -hmm. 2, 8, it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So if you've been saved by grace, it's because you've heard the word of God. And then look at verse 10. So verse, verse 10 take, takes away the whole, the whole um, so-called controversy of, well, is it, is it faith or is it works? Or is it, is it grace or is it works? Well, it's really before and after. So, so it's both. We're not saved by works. We know that. We're saved by grace. But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And, that, and again, you go back to Matthew 7, 24, and you hear the word of God and you act upon it. So I just, I saw that parallel uh, between these two scriptures here. And there's another comment I'll, I'll make too, is that, um, you know, Paul explains that whoever loves God is known by God. So that's another relationship intimacy right there that you're talking about. And uh, we have to have, you know, it's loving and knowing him. So so that's another point too, yeah, that we have to love him so that he'll know us. And so if we love him, he's not going to say, depart from me because I never knew you. Right. Yeah. Amen, brother. Yeah. Hey, man. Uh, um, how are you doing, uh, brothers? And uh, hope you are well. Yeah, the good, a uh, good study. Um, one point that called that called me attention was uh, when Jesus said, "Once they hear, they hear my words and put into practice." I it it calls me attention a lot because uh, uh, it means for me, I have to deny myself. I have to to put all the things that I have aside and put God first in my heart. And uh, uh, I have to thinking about that. 
because uh, my attitude is is, a, is according to this word of Christ. I've I've I I I I, I say to myself, uh, I am given a, a example um, of. Uh, a change of the guide through the scripture to the words of God according to my attitudes. Um, uh, I'm thinking about that. And I thank you, thank you for the words. And uh, one point, one more point. I, uh, we can, I think we can lose our, our salvation if you, we do not, accord, uh, do not act according to to the scripture, uh, to the uh, the words of Christ Jesus, uh, he calls uh, he calls us a lot to repent, and have to repent. That means we have to change our attitudes. You don't have to to do the bad things or the sins again. It is an example of a changing attitude and to be born again. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Did, did you say we cannot lose our salvation? Uh, I I believe I can I can uh, lose my salvation if I uh, uh, if I don't act um, according to Christ's word. So the um, scriptural teaching is that we cannot. So if if you have the spirit of God living inside you, you, you are going to be compelled by the, by the spirit of God to live according to, to his word. And I think there's a, um, there's a passage in John and I, some of the brothers might be able to help me out. I don't know if it's, um, I can okay. So John six, is it John six brother? But yeah, yeah. Um, go, go ahead, Brother Doyle. But but just, sure. just just really quick, I want to preface what Brother Doyle is going to say is that the scripture um, um, absolutely teaches that, that, we, that we cannot lose our salvation if if we're truly saved. Amen. I got a lot of scriptures here that has to deal with that subject. So if you want to write these down. Assurance of salvation found in 1 John 5, 12 through 13. Found in the book of John 5, 24. Found in the book of Jude 1, 24. Found in the book of Romans 8, 16. Found in the book of Hebrews 7, 25. Found in the book of John 10, 29. Book of Ephesians 4, 30. Back in the book of John 647. One of my favorites is this one right here, Romans 8, 38 through 39. That's just a few of the scriptures, and there's many more. But I like how you brought out the study. What God has chosen. We are the sheep of his pasture, and the sheep hear my voice. Yeah. And when the sheep goes astray, God's going to get that sheep back. But he is going to come a time where he is going to separate the sheep from the goats. So it's all coming down to the scriptures. But that is a great, what are we basing our salvation on? If our salvation is based on anything that we do. Then we're not based putting our salvation in what Jesus Christ did. And that's why he asked his disciples, who do others say that I am? He asked him a very personal question. Amen. Who do you say that I am? And that's what he wanted to know. And the apostle Peter said, thou art the Messiah. And that Messiah means Amen. the anointed one. And he was the one that came from heaven to seek and to save those who are lost and every single one of us were lost and when you're truly found and chosen by God 
You have the gift, the free gift of salvation because it is not by works. But works do come in after you're saved because you mentioned there in scripture that we are created to do the will, of, to, do, to do God's will, not our own will, but to do the will of God. That I struggle Amen. with every day because the flesh wants to do my own will. So it's a battle. And we are in a battle. Yeah. But we know that we should know that in our own individual life that we're getting stronger in the spirit. The more that we hunger for the, the word, the more that we hunger for Bible ship study. Like this. And we're, we're not a lone ranger in this. And each one of us needs to be encouraged. Um, because this is just the world that is out to to really devour us. And we have a tremendous enemy and we're, we're part of that enemy ourselves. So remember, we have some adversaries that are against us, but we have the victory and the victory is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother Ed, I wanna, um, I, I wanna encourage you with a couple of scriptures. Um, I'm for, so the first one's going to be John 10, uh, 27 to 29. I'm going to read that and I'm going to take you to one in Romans because um, I don't I don't want you or any other brother to be tormented. If you've truly been if you've truly been born again, you're truly a Amen. believer into thinking that somehow you've got to hang on to it or or somehow it's dependent upon something that you do or that you can lose it in some way. Because it's because and I'm just telling you in love, it's not a biblical thing. So let me let me encourage you with a couple of these scriptures. OK, so John 10, 27 through 29 says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. This might be the best in all of scripture to tell us that, that if, if we have salvation, that it can't be taken away from us. Amen. Um, Amen. And then the other one is going to be Romans chapter eight. So let's look at Romans chapter eight, maybe the greatest uh, chapter in the whole Bible. There's a lot of, of, of greatest chapters. Romans chapter eight. So Romans chapter eight, verse one and two, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That one verse right there um, is great evidence. Um, there, there, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's just an, inc an incredible statement. And then look at. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things come, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So these couple of scripture here um tell us without any doubt whatsoever that if if we are a believer um if we've been born again that cannot be taken away from us yeah, yeah. so always think think of your works as fruit always think of your works as fruit um, right. not not something that you need to do to hang on um so i i hope that encouraged you brother okay thank you thank you so much i i I mentioned that because uh, uh, about uh, losing the salvation because I was reading Romans uh, chapter 11, uh, 11 through 21 uh, in grafted branches, the title, mm. in grafted, in grafted branches. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the end, uh, he says, uh, 
do not boast over those branches. If you do consider this, you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off cause of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branch, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and the uh, uh, going on, uh, sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but a kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if you do not do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. So I see um, in verse 21, that's that's the key. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. That's a warning, right? That's a warning. Um, but when you look down... Um, in verse 23, it says, and they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief will be grafted in. So that's really just a negative way of saying if they, if they believe, if they have faith, right? Yeah. Um, so this, this is a warning, um, for us not to look proudly. Um, and if someone is not spared, then it means that that person never had salvation. That's it. Yeah, Brother Ed, you know, every time the question comes up, Lauren says that I get mad. <laughs> oh. But, you know, you know if, if, you read, if you read the scriptures, you're never going to find that question. So you, you, you've got the book of Acts, and then you got, you know, the New Testament. And no one ever asked, can I lose my salvation? It wasn't a question that, that, that was brought up. And I always bring it up to marriage. You know, I'm a, I'm a married guy. I don't wake up today and think, am I going to divorce today? Is my wife going to divorce me today? You know, and if I do the things that are going to cause divorce, then I probably start raising the question. But the truth is that you think, you think God gives salvation just to anybody? No. You know, you, he doesn't, right? So you got no. 12 apostles. One of them, did all of them have salvation? You know, you have, no. you have Judas who followed Jesus for three years. And that could be one of us here in this group, okay? It could be, you know, we, we attend church and we're constantly in there, but our hearts are far away from him. You know, didn't, didn't Jesus say, didn't Jesus tell the Pharisees that you, um, what did he say? Uh, you, you glorify me with your mouth, but your hearts are far from me. Mm -hmm. You know, so we could be attending these little groups. You know, we could be attending church and we think we're saved. You know, because we said this prayer or we said something. But the truth is, do we really have salvation? Look yeah. what look what first John chapter two says. If you want to turn there, first John chapter two, verse 19. <coughs> first John chapter two, verse 19 says, These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. So you notice that they were part of the church. They were part of, they were following, but they never, they never belonged to the church because they left. You see, one of, one of the attributes of a, of a believer is faithfulness. How do we know that? Because Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says that the fruits of the spirits are love, joy. One of those is faithfulness. And if you notice in the new Testament, every time somebody got saved, Paul, Peter, James, John, all the disciples, in fact, the true believers, they didn't lose their salvation. They died for their salvation physically. They gave up their lives for Jesus Christ. That's faithfulness. You know, one of the questions on Facebook today was, can we have backsliders? Well, if they're backsliding, they probably don't have Jesus Christ. You know, people don't, people don't sell everything to, to, to buy the treasure of land and then let it go. The truth is they probably don't have the Holy Spirit, which is faithfulness. And so going back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, he says, These people left our churches, 
because they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong to us. So did they lose their salvation? No, they never really belonged to us. They were just following <laughs> along. They were just in the church. They were just, you know, attending these kind of groups. But they never really belonged to us. That means they were never, never really saved. And then he goes, verse 20. Look at verse 20. But you are not like that. For the Holy One has given you the Spirit. And all of you know the truth. See, he's like, those that left, they never really belonged to us. But you're not like that. Why? Because you remain faithful. And that's just, that, that's just it there. You know, you want to know if you're saved? You'll remain faithful to Jesus Christ. You know? Also, Look at verse 21. I am writing, so I am writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. How do they know the truth? How do they know the difference? Because they study God's word. Lauren mentioned that one of the attributes to a true believer is that they love the word of God. They do the word of God. So if you find yourself not loving the word of God, then I would raise the question. I would question my salvation i would question the bible says to examine yourself to see if you're in the faith if i don't love god's word am i really saved you know if i don't love to to obey jesus christ am i really saved jesus says if you love me you will obey my commands see his commands are not burdensome to me if god tells me to do something i don't i don't get out of shape because we love his word verse 22 says who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. But today, today we call these people atheists. We don't call them antichrist. So he's saying, who's a liar? Well, they are. They're liars. They're antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son does not have the Father. <clears throat> and Titus... So we keep thinking of atheists. We keep thinking of atheists, atheists. But look at Titus 1.16, and I'll end with that one. Titus 1.16 says, Such people claim to know God, but they deny him by the way they live. See, the atheists, they, they boldly say that there is no God. But these fake Christians, they tell you with their lives. It says, such people claim to know God, but they deny him by the way they live. So just watch my life. If my life is the opposite of the Bible, then you know that I'm just a liar. I'm just, an, I'm just like the atheist. I may say I'm saved, but my life will tell you whether I'm saved or not. That's where he comes with, you know, prove, but, you know, works without faith is dead. Your, your, your works come right after you, right? Like one was saying, it's one after the other. Your words prove that you're saved. Such people claim to know God, but they deny him by the way they live. I mean, I tell you, I'm not, I don't deny Jesus Christ. No, your life tells me that you deny Jesus Christ. So, my salvation, you probably never had it because of the way you live. That's why when the question comes up, I always think to myself, these people that bring up the question probably just don't know because why would you why would, would the Lord give you something? God doesn't mess up. God knows your heart. And when, and when, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. When the Holy Spirit comes to a person, he changes them radically. Radically. The problem is that too many people <clears throat> say they come to Christ and there is no change. They say, oh, well, you know, he, he's losing his salvation. No, there, there was no change. Amen. Let, let me, um, and I, and I, I want to make a point about um, what I think is really important about biblical interpretation. Let's say I come to a really hard passage, like that Romans 11 passage. That's a hard passage. Never, never look at that in a box and never look at that in light of just itself always look at it in the in the greater context of the passage look look for another explanation within that passage what corner yeah what corner but if um if you don't find it in that passage 
go to another place in scripture to find it. And what better place to go than to the gospels and to the words of, of our Lord Jesus. Um, that's always going to supersede anything else. It's never going to contradict it. Um, scripture doesn't contradict scripture. Um, but um, if you if you're struggling with a really difficult passage, try to find try to find something in the context of that same passage that helps explain it. I think Paul does that in Romans 11, but a lot of his writings are hard. I think Paul's are the hardest. And especially um, certain parts of Romans are really hard to understand <laughs> personally. Okay. Um, but always, always try to go somewhere else in scripture to get clarification on something. If it's, <clears throat> if it's, if it's that, right. So if it's, Hey, it's about salvation. Um, let me go, let me go somewhere else and actually hear and, and hear what Jesus says about it. Even so, I think you can find it somewhere in that passage. Um, but always, always look elsewhere. So you can, you can be edified and built up. That's, that's what I try okay. to do personally. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. The you know, one thing interesting about that topic is that no one has ever defined what it is that you do lose your salvation. You know, how, how do you lose it? I mean, what, is there a number of sins that you can commit or no one ever do this? So I would lean more towards um, just following God's word. That way you make sure you don't, you know, you can't lose it that way. But um, yeah, it just seems weird that, um, you know, no one has ever defined, okay, if you do this, this, and that, you're going to be out of here. You know, you know, there's things on a, if you, if you follow, like on a job, if you don't do certain things, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you're going to get fired. They have specific guidelines. But what is it that will cause you to lose your salvation? No one's ever said it. So right there, I would think that must be um, false doctrine. That's just it. If, if, you know, and, 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 and Jesus said that if you love me, you will obey my commands. So if I obey, I don't have to worry. Because let's just say Ponte is wrong. Let's say I am wrong. Maybe you could lose your salvation. But why would I worry about that if, if, if I'm obeying mm -hmm. Jesus Christ? I wouldn't worry about that. I don't, like I said about marriage. I don't wake up and worry whether I'm going to be divorced today or not. No. Sure. You know, and if I'm doing the things that are causing divorce, well, then maybe I should be worried, right? Yeah. yeah. Let's let Brother Fang speak. I think he's been trying to get in there. Go ahead, Brother Fang. Yes. Uh, we see the salvation, yes. The basic for the security of salvation does not rest with man. Mm. It is the works of God salvation is we see very clearly we see in the Ephesians chapter one it was <clears throat> talking about step by step about how our salvation in Romans chapter 8 also Romans chapter 8 verse 28 to 30 you will see how God has done our salvation securing of securing work of Father Son and the Holy Spirit you will see in every passage in the scripture Security of salvation. And one is in Romans 11, you will see it is eschatological passage. Mostly it's talk about the restoration of Israel in Romans chapter 1. Uh, so, sorry, Romans chapter 11. It is uh, es eschatological passage. Mostly talking about the people of Israel, how it will be in the future. Yeah, so we have to uh, see in Romans chapter 11. In Romans chapter 10 is also talking about the Gentile people. You will see, we have to know how. The book of Romans is very, how to say, deeply. It is a great passage. It was written by step by step. And we see in chapter 9 to 11, it's talking about dispensational passage mostly in the book of Romans. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Brother Thang. We have Myanmar and we have Brazil. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. Holy Father, we um, we thank you so much for this study today, Lord. And 